Hello and welcome to Intentional Critical Conversations, The Interview. I'm your host and academic coordinator, Sarah Ann Sumito, Cape Cod Community College, and welcome. This is Activism in the Round, and today our guest is from Cape Cod Theater Company, Howard's Junior Theater Company, Incorporated, Miss Nina Sheshler, Producing Artistic Director. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Sarah Ann. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So today we have a bevy of questions that are not only theater related, but activism related. So let's jump right in here. So Nina, you and I, we go back a few decades here, and we have great um, camaraderie on and off the stage throughout Suffolk County, Plymouth County, and Bonstable County. So let's just jump right in. Um, tell us about your current role at Cape Cod Theatre Company. Well, I've been the producing artistic director for 25 years, um, since 1996. And, you know, I've had the pleasure of producing over 270 plays and musicals. I've worked with so many wonderful collaborators throughout the Cape from many different areas and in the theater designers, directors, um, actors, and our students, you know, who we bring up in the theater, who we invite into the world of the theater. And we have a wonderful history. We're in our yeah. 70th year this 70. year. 70, thank you. So, Nina, let's just switch gears just a little. I personally know your commitment to diversity, but let's talk about the theater's commitment to diversity. I think we have a strong commitment to diversity, but we need to be more intentional in terms of how we act on it. Um, we, we've always um, had non-traditional casting in terms of, you know, uh, what, what used to be uh, defined as, you know, colorblind casting, um, which I'm not, I don't think that's the proper term, really. That, that, but an open casting policy where um, we didn't cast necessarily by type or by, by race, but by talent and ability. Um, and we've also wanted to produce and have produced plays throughout the years that go to what is happening in our culture and our society. Um, wanting to bring forth the human spirit and, and togetherness and, and brotherhood and sisterhood and making the world a better place and bringing good citizenship um, through the theater uh, to the fore. And, and I think that's what our theater does. I think um, through our education and, and our productions, we really encourage the golden rule and and to create good citizens of the world and, and of the theater. Okay, thank you. So as of late, um, and let's go a little deeper than that, not as of late, historically and structured and systemic, um, I'm leading towards uh, this word, inclusivity and, and racial injustice we've seen a lot of issues in the world. What is the theater doing specifically now to combat that? I know there's some uh, educational trainings out there that theaters are tackling these issues with. What is um, our theater doing? What is, what is well, the our theater, um, we're, we're working with Theater for Young Audience consultants, um, and in terms of we have an anti-racism and equity and belonging committee. And we're doing, um, we're consulting with TYA to make sure that um, we're combating systemic racism in the theater and in the world. But um, the idea of inclusion, I don't necessarily like that word because it also, it, it, it makes, it, it others, it creates an othering. Um, we like the term belonging more than inclusion. Because inclusion almost says that there's somebody um, else who's making the decision to include, you know, and I think that that sort of creates uh, a schism. So we try to use the term belonging 
to belong to the theater, to have a theater where everyone belongs, um, that there's not a hierarchy including everyone. You know, it's it, it's sort of a, a strange word, really, including. Thank you. We're here, but we're going to include you. You know, <laughs> but anyway, our our board of directors um, is really for a BIPOC committee, and we have a committee of I think twelve people who are very involved in working with um, uh, with theater for young audiences and going through many many steps in looking at ourselves in terms of how we can create an environment where everyone belongs. Thank you. So BIPOC, tell us about the BIPOC Cabaret. Where did that come out of, uh, the movement? Tell us about that movement it came out of. And tell us a little bit about your activism and where that came from. Well, the BIPOC Cabaret, you know, I was talking to um, a few of our students um, and, you know, after the George Floyd killing, um, we really decided that we needed to take a, a stronger role in, in spotlighting uh, incredible artists of, of color, and, and we wanted to do that. So we, Hannah McLaughlin and I put together, you know, are invited. Um, people who we felt could really speak to the time and to, you know, what it feels like and to, you know, to, to show their talent, but also to speak to what it means uh, to have systemic racism. And I think a lot of people don't, don't understand quite what systemic means. Um, it's 400 years. It's not just, you know, uh, Racism. It, it's something that's in the culture. It's 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 already here. And um, even though you might think that you're not a racist, we're living in a culture where which structure where the structures are inherently, you know, othering, and um, where there's hierarchy. And 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 this is something we want to come back. Thank you. And, you know, as artists, we are always proactive. So I want to jump to the lunar celebration. You know, we came up with that. You came up with that. And Hannah McLaughlin came up with that long before the tragedy in Atlanta. Um, unfortunately, there was, you know, an attack on Asian women in Atlanta. So tell us about uh, that lunar celebration uh, where we celebrated the Asian culture. Well, Hannah McLaughlin, who is Asian, um, came to me and said, you know, could we do a Lunar New Year celebration? And I said, of course, of course we can. And so she reached out to some of her collaborators and um, that she knew in the area. And and we decided, you know, we really wanted to, to put this together. And it, it is one of the most beautiful evenings and you can still access it on our website um, but it really speaks to the depth and the greatness of the Asian community and and what they bring to art and and to uh, the world and but also how terrible it is how awful it is that um, what happened in, in the last administration um, has created such violence against the Asian community. Um, it's it's another form of othering and blaming and scapegoating, and it it really had no place. And it's based on cruelty and ignorance. Um, so uh, you know the whole COVID scare and to call it the Chinese virus. I mean, it was a really awful thing and. Um, the Asian community has paid a terrible price for it. Um, I know people who are afraid to walk out of their houses, you know, and uh, and be on the street or be on the subway. So, you know. Well, thank you so much, Nina. Um, and to let's take a step back with your activism. I've called your segment activism in the round. One of the things as a director and also 
as a performer, we do have a fear of directing in the round and performing in the round, but you do not have a fear of being an activist. Could you tell us a little bit about your activism and when you first began that? Because there's something very surprising. Uh, it wasn't a surprise to me when you told me something about uh, your history with African Americans and a specific party in the African American culture, but it may become um, known to the audience and maybe a surprise. So fill us in a little bit about that in your college well, days. I grew up um, in Brockton um, uh, during the civil rights movement of the late 50s and the 60s, and my mother was an activist, and my father was. Uh, my mother was a Holocaust survivor, and uh, my father immigrated from the pogroms in, in Russia. So, you know, they were very, very sensitive um, to civil rights and human rights. Um, and I think just growing up, you know, Brockton was, a, you know, it was a mixed community. I mean, we had, you know, we had friends who, you know, were, and, and we were exposed to people of all different nationalities and cultures. and. Um, and I think that's basically because of, you know, who my parents were. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, my mother marched in the civil rights movement. Um, she marched in Washington. Um, and um, she worked at the VA hospital, um, where I also worked as a, as a teenager. And I was exposed to people who served our country who were of all cultures. And um, to me, it was, you know, it was just part of my life. When I went to college, it was the um, early 70s during the Vietnam War. And, you know, I became an, an activist uh, with Students for Democratic Society and, and protesting against the war at that time. So I guess that's where it started, I, you know. But in terms of theater, I always believed that it was important to bring everybody into the theater. Um, I started my career directing shows like The New Nobody Knows. Um, and, um, and we did a play at, at our theater called Branded Hands, you know, about the Underground Railroad in Harwich. Um, and, uh, you know, and I just think it's, it, you know, over the years, we really tried to present plays with cast that were multicultural. And we've always encouraged, you know, people to partake. I don't think that the structure of theater necessarily encourages people of all backgrounds to come and to attend. Um, part of it is transportation issues. Part of it is the kind of work we're presenting. Uh, part of it is <clears throat> making excuses like saying, well, they're not, there aren't enough people of color on the Cape, which isn't true. Harwich is a multicultural community, and we have a great Cape Verdean community. Um, actually, our Cape Verdean community helped build our theater. Um, so I think you know, we're at a place where we can really make a difference, and, and we have the history uh, and a commitment to it. it. It's just a matter of really taking actual, actionable steps to make that happen. And that's what we've tried to do with, you know, during COVID, it's difficult, but we tried to do it with the BIPOC cabaret um, and with uh, the Lunar New Year celebration. Okay, thank you. So sticking with the the line of history, let's talk about The Wiz. So we know The Wiz, 1970s, a huge African-American musical on Broadway, then adapted to film starring Michael Jackson, Nipsey Russell, and of course, Diana Ross. But it <laughs> came to Howard's Junior Theater. So let's talk about that. You played a major role in The Wiz. Well, um, I produced it um, several years ago. We had a wonderful cast. It was multicultural, but the leads were of color, um, and and that was really important. Um, <clears throat> initially, we had some pushback uh, from a few board members saying that, oh, you know, you really can't do the whiz because you know it should be 
um, uh, it should be cast with all African American performers. And you know, I looked it up, and I I, I contacted some experts in the field, and they said, no, you can you can mix it up as long as you're really trying and really true to you know the lead the lead play, some of the lead players. Um, and, you know, I think we were, I can't really remember, but we had, you know, a beautiful Dorothy and we had uh, the lion and, you know, it was a really mixed cast. I mean, it was a, it was a great cast and it was, um, and it was very su successful. It was a beautiful production, but I felt like I had to, you know, fight for it to be produced. Um, and, and I'm glad that finally it was, and and that we presented it, and that it was as successful as it was. We've also produced um, shows like Once on This Island. Um, we did that show twice, which was also a a great production. We had to use some white people in it, but you know, um, but but not all, and and that was really important too. Um, and you know, I think that you have to do the best you can. We produced a Snow White with an African American Snow White. Um, we've produced shows that you know where where we've had incredible talent. Um, but a lot of times we don't like when I directed Tuck Everlasting. You know, the lead girl Winnie, um, she's of color, and um, nobody nobody. I had a student, a former student, who said to me, I mean, I was so happy to see Winnie on stage because no, you, nobody thought anything of it. You know, and here was an African-American girl playing a lead role, and there are African-American students in our audience. And it just, you know, it was telling the story. And, and it just made things, nor it normalized things. You know, and, and I think that's important. Thank you. So as an activist, a really important question. Could you, you know, tell us the election of DeVal Patrick to the State House, becoming the first African American governor, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? What did that mean to you? And then even greater, uh, reelected, and even greater than that, the election of Barack Obama to the White House, what did that mean to you? And reelected to the White House. It just, to me, it just made my heart sing because it made me think that times really were changing. Um, I'll never forget the celebration. Um, you know, when when both of them were elected. I mean, we were screaming. We we're thinking, oh, you know, the world really is changing. Things are happening. They're moving forward. You know, like all the work from the from the civil rights movement in the in the fifties and the sixties. It was it was working. You know, the, and there was there was just tremendous tremendous hope. Um, and I think there still is. But you know, as Toni Morrison said, there's always a backlash. And um, Frankly, I believe, you know, what we've experienced in the past four years prior to President Biden was a backlash. It was a backlash of, um, of you know, President Obama, and it was a backlash uh, against, you know, the rights of African Americans. Um, and and that's, that's heartbreaking to me. Um, when I first came to the Cape in 1974, my first best friend, you know, was Rosanna Warfield, who ended up teaching at the college. We worked in uh, the field of um, community services alcoholism program together. And, and then, you know, just coming, live, being able to live in Harwich and having deep relationships um, with, you know, people who were instrumental in founding the theater. Mabel Canto, who was a great activist in Harwich. Lisa Canto, Teddy Canto. Um, you know, there are so many people. And to me, you know, we need to amplify and say how important, you know, 
uh, it is to have um, to have brotherhood and sisterhood and love in the world and to have belonging. Um, you know, without appropriation, without appropriating a culture, but with uh, true love and respect and welcoming. And we need to find a way to make our theater more welcoming. Um, and and I hope we do. I hope we can. And I think Tamara Harper, our director of education, is doing everything she can to spearhead that effort as well, as well as people on the board, um, such as you. <laughs> so uh, before we conclude, I, I want to throw out um, a huge directing question. So this is a heavy hitter. Hopefully it's not a directing nightmare, but a directing dream come true. I have a few names that I, I want to throw out at you. Suzanne Laurie Parks, August Wilson, okay, Amari Baraka, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Jean Sakata. All of these people have a direct connection to Massachusetts, of course. August Wilson, the cycle of plays at Huntington Theater Company. If you could direct any of these people's works, uh, which one would you choose? And maybe tell us a little bit why you would choose their works. And uh, often people just think of Lin-Manuel for Hamilton and in, in the Heights, but they forget that he actually took West Side Story and translated it in, into Spanish. So who would you choose <laughs> and why? Well, to me, I mean, the person in terms of my artistic style that I, I just think is an utter genius. I can't even believe how brilliant she is as Susie Laurie Parks. I mean, uh, just her, the way that she uses um, metaphor and archetype and, and myth in her work. I mean, she wrote 365 plays in 365 days, which is, to me, unbelievable. Um, and you know her top dog underdog just a just a brilliant brilliant play so to me just her use of um myth is um and her symbolism is so refined and and beautiful um that i think there's there's so many layers in her work um that I just I, I just can't get over her her abilities her genius. Um, August Wilson, of course, and I love the way his in his plays like characters evolve, you know, um, from fences to the piano lesson. I mean, and and I think he writes so truly to the African American experience. The question is whether I'd be the right person, you know, to direct. Because part of me thinks, as a producer, I'd rather hire an African American director for these works. But you know, all things <laughs> being equal, I think um, uh, Suzanne Laurie Parks is somebody who, you know, I just totally, totally admire her work. Also, Jean Sakata. I mean. Um, what she wrote about, you know, the Japanese experience uh, during World War II. I mean, we're having a reflection of that now. I mean, it's the it's the same dynamic based on ignorance, um, where uh, Asian community is, you know, looked at as other. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think. She's an amazing writer, and she's an actor, a musician. I mean, these people are just geniuses, brilliant. Well, Nina, thank you so much for spending this time with us, for your wisdom, for sharing your life with us and uh, your expertise. We thank you so much for all that you've been doing for not only the theater community, but for the community at large. Thank you. Stay well, stay blessed, stay lifted. And please stay theatrical. And thank you for joining us with Intentional Critical Conversations, the interview.